Hello, hello, good evening. Okay. Today I am dealing with the most beautiful human beings ever. And uh, I'm so happy that you guys are here with me because man, we have so much to discuss today. And actually always, right? That's what we're gonna have today because I hope that we're gonna be able to help a lot of other people once they hear what we discuss and oh, yeah. all the challenges and the successes that we've had and how we go about doing it, empowering others. And maybe we'll get some clarity as well about some of the things that we need to be uh, doing ourselves. So thank you for coming. Let us because, know you when know, you open the wine. <laughs> you know, that would have been a great idea. Does anybody else have wine? I think I have some sangria. I think I got that. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, okay, so I'm... This is just water. <laughs> How can I be the host and not even have any of that stuff right at my fingertips? We can do that. We don't have to prepare, no cleanup. <laughs> exactly. Kelly, you have to unmute yourself. Me and Kelly going out for happy hour after the meeting. You can join. Oh, <laughs> are you really going on a, are you going out for happy hour? Yeah. Is there a happy hour? Yeah, we just, when I invited Kelly yesterday, I said, let's celebrate and go out. Okay. So should I go get some beverages? Sure. <laughs> Get a beverage. Okay, I'll be right back, but I just don't want to leave. I don't want to leave. I want to see all of you. And you know what? Sometimes the hosts don't get to participate in the, you know, sitting at the table, right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. For showing up. Thank you. Okay, so and then we're going to start because I think we have a pretty good uh, table. Of people here and uh, I am excited to begin and see what happens okay so here we are discussion on the multiple disability disability roundtable uh, my name is Herman Wilson I am hosting this event and I am excited to introduce these young ladies who are going to be very brave to discuss their own challenges and successes and hopefully we can add a lot of value to the people who are going to be looking at this in the future and and also for us because we're gonna hear a lot of the things that maybe we need to be paying attention to and someone else can give us a little bit more clarity so i'll ask kirsi introduce yourself guys i'm kirsi's incarnacion I am the parent of an awesome, well, two awesome kids. Um, one of them uh, with multiple diagnosis. Um, Sebastian has, uh, well, he's a preemie. He's a miracle baby. He was born at six months. He was one pound when he was born. He's like this big. He, and he's been a little fighter ever since. And Allison will tell you, because she's a teacher. <laughs> he's a little fighter. He has, he has autism. He has ADHD. And he has epilepsy and cognitive deficiency. But he's a great kid. You know, he's, uh, we have a lot of um, challenges and hurdles. He is high functioning. He is verbal. We have, you know, multiple uh, of challenges with Sebas. But like I said, he's a great kid and, and I'm married. And his other brother is neurotypical. His other brother is named Emmanuel. Uh, they're 14 months apart. So can you imagine how fun that is? They're almost twins. <laughs> they look identical from what I hear. They call them the twins. But they're, you know, they're great kids. They're great kids. And... Uh, and Emmanuel helps me a lot. I don't know if any of you, of you of your kiddos have siblings. I don't know. But, you know, my other son, even though he gets frustrated a lot, he's a big help most of the time, especially, you know, when he has a seizure, he's a big help. And I'm just really glad that we have this support group, the support system that we have here, that Hermine reached out to me. Well, I think we all have a wealth of knowledge. And together, I mean, we can be amazing. What I don't know, you guys can teach me. What you guys don't know, I can teach you. We have the knowledge of a teacher. I don't know if any of you are teachers, but we have Allison here. She's a special needs teacher, and she's... Agatha? Hi, everyone. My name is Agatha Jacek. My son is almost 21 years old. Hard to believe. We're going to drink wine together soon. 
<laughs> and he's the one with diagnosis of autism. I want to share with you a happy moment that happened to us. Behind me, you see handmade, handmade sign made by my eight-year-old because my son just graduated college. Congratulations. So she wrote to him, congrats, grad, right? It's still there. We're going to keep it until the real graduation ceremony come back. It was scheduled on May 2nd that he's supposed to walk on stage. He graduated from MDC. We are very proud of him. He continued his education again. He's going to start his summer semester on June 1st, on Monday to get his associate degree. So I'm the mom of the older child. I, I'm not sure if I heard what's the age of Kyrsis son. Sebastian is 15. A 15, so he's teenage. So it's wonderful. First of all, I want to take a moment to say thank you for our host for doing that. It's amazing. And it's, it's a good thing that we are mom of kids with different age. We can all share, I can share my experiences, how to navigate through college, how to talk to professors, my experience. And Kelly also can share, she has an older son, how to start navigating a job for works and so many topics, so many topics. I know this is the first meeting and it's just gonna be amazing because I'm planning to get to know you more, better, and just support each other and share and help each other because I truly believe there is a power in us, in power, parents. I'm the person who doesn't like to complain and criticize the system, the public. I'm actually one of the first person who many years ago was on a panel in the school board and I stood up and I, I was the only one who say thank you to our education educators and teachers. I point out the amazing program that my son was after changing schools. So I believe when you not just criticizing but looking for the good stuff and taking the lead, an example, that helps a lot. That, that boosts up our motivation. Because unfortunately, from my experience, when we just complain, complain, it doesn't have a positive effect. We just have to be an example that it's possible and others will follow. That's how I, I want to empower other parents. And amazing things can happen. I'm sorry. I'm too excited. Oh, Next. <laughs> Agatha, and you brought up some great points. Kelly, we want to know about you. Hi. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I am a mother of Tyler. He is autistic. He's 25 years old. And he's doing awesome. Um, he went through the school system. We, we traveled and went through a couple different school systems. There's some good, good and bad, but he's doing well. He's actually working. He works for downtown for when the Heat basketball plays. He works for Libre Restaurant um, in the Amway or AA uh, Stadium. He got cut short this year because of everything with the COVID. Um, uh, possibly looking for a job in the summertime, but he's doing good. He's pretty high functioning, a little bit of issues with the school system, good and bad, but we could compare because we went to different schools. And he's a friend of Nathan, Agatha's son, and um, it's good to meet other people, other parents that are very interested to evolve I feel that a lot of my information uh, came from the parents and it helped me a lot. So hopefully we can learn from you, how your, how your kids are doing and maybe something you can learn from us. I'm very proud of my son. Great. Awesome. I think we need to hear from Allison. 
Hi. Okay, so I'm Allison. I do not have children with autism, but I have baby brothers that do. They are four years old. One is high functioning, one is very low functioning. They're, they're verbal, but I'm pretty sure we have more underlying conditions, but because they're so young, we haven't, we haven't been able to test on everything. I'm also a teacher. I'm Sebastian's teacher. I've been with special needs for the past four years. I'm doing the transition program. So I have high school, the older middle school students, and I'm trying to transition them into an adult program. For me, I just want to have the best resources so I can get these kids out and have a job, have a life outside of um, their parents, being able to live for themselves and not having to rely on anybody. And I do agree that the school system can be very good and very bad, and I've seen both sides. And so I just want to be a part of the difference and help and get these kids where they need to be basically. So I'm willing to learn from everybody, especially from you, Kelly and Agatha, with your older students, because I really want to implement a good adult program at my school. And so just hearing what you guys missed out on or what you have been able to participate in will help me help these future children going into adulthood. Thank you, Allison, Chrissy, Kelly, and Agatha. Um, I think this is wonderful because I'll tell you my story. I am, of course, Herman, and uh, I have a 13-year-old. Yeah, well, it's a big milestone for me because you don't know what's going to happen when you hear the news of your child's challenges or deficits. And I got mine at a very early stage. He's not supposed to be walking, talking, or learning anything, but I wanted to defy all the naysayers, and that took a lot of work. And any parent out there with a kid with special need or a family member with special need like Allison has, it's very emotional. It's very challenging, and dependent on what your culture is, you, you're not even allowed to really say, I'm having a very difficult time. It's, uh, it's, it just depends. So Needless to say, I think a, a lot of our successes and um, comes from really your mindset. And my mindset was always that, okay, the reality is that I have a kid, possibly will have a kid with special needs, and I would need to do whatever it took to change that. What, do, what actions do I have to take? And those actions were to achieve the goal of having what Allison is talking about, a kid who would have as normal a life as possible, a quality life, and also to be independent eventually of the mother, okay? And that's, it, it doesn't have to be 100%, but as independent as we can get, as I could get my child. And that took a lot of resources, a lot of fighting, a lot of fighting with the schools, even sometimes your medical care provider, even sometimes your uh, health aid, even sometimes your family, right? You, I mean, because sometimes if you're not there, you, you, they don't understand what it is that you're going through. And I see everybody shaking their heads because that's sometimes you have to educate. How do you educate your family about what are the challenges that you have and that, you know, Everything is not as so cut and dry that you can do this and this is going to happen. <laughs> so needless to say, I said all of that because I have a 13 year old now and I'm so thrilled to be going through this journey with him and that I'm so blessed to be his advocate because now through all of the hard work that we've done, he, even though he's on the autism spectrum, he has cerebral palsy as well as the visual impairment. We've come a long way. I am so blessed to have him. I'm so blessed to be with him. I'm so blessed to have my family and my friends and the resources in the community that help. But there is more that can be done, right? Right. He is able to read excellently he's able to do all of the things and also he wants to be on his own and i'm like that's why we're doing this stuff <laughs> that's why we're doing it so he's a, he's he's 
you know, they say that your kids learn from you and that is so true. That is so true. We are the mentors and the examples for our kids and they learn from us regardless of if they can speak or they can't speak. So I'm going to open this up. Originally, when I thought about doing this uh, round table, it was months ago and I was putting it in my head and planning and had a big schedule. And then I was going to do all these invitations. And now with COVID-19, just like it is with our kids, we have to switch and change and we have to be very agile. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to go to what our discussion should be, the challenges that we are having now. Our families are facing a lot of challenges due to COVID-19. We have our emotional health. We have the lack of therapies or how are you substituting for therapies? I want to know how you're feeling right now. How have you been challenged? What have you been doing to ensure that you're keeping calm and your family is focused on what we have to do and with the lack of different resources, et cetera, and different supports? How are we doing, ladies? Who wants to take the floor first? We're going to be transparent because this is the only way we're going to be able to help people. And ourselves, by the way, I think we think that we're helping everybody else, but really we're helping ourselves to be able to discuss things openly, honestly, and with an open mind to hearing others. I don't mind starting. So I don't know if many of you heard about the story about Alejandro Ripley who was murdered by his mother. He actually was a former student at our school. Oh. Before, he, it was before I was there, but I see the memorial every single day because it, it happened right across the street from our school. So just seeing something like that and the times that we have and having to look at my baby brothers and the students that I have, and I'm just, it breaks my heart. I have to, I have to cry, like I'm about to cry right now because I, I don't know. I don't know how to cope with that. And it's actually affected me a lot more than I thought it would. So, ah. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Yes, we understand. That's somebody who was close to you and must have had a big impact on you because you know that a lot of parents are struggling. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's very important for us to speak our truth. And if we're having an issue, let's talk about it. Let's let's get it out there. Call somebody. Call your mama. Even if they don't understand, let them know, hey, I'm struggling because it's so important that we let people know that everything is not perfect. How could it be? Mm -hmm. It's not perfect when you have a kid without special needs. Exactly. And yet we're trying to be the superheroes, the educator, the wife or husband, because the wife is at work and the husband may be taking care of it. I wish we had some men on the panel, but it's the way it is. And it would have been great to hear another gender's voice, but I understand what you're feeling, Allison, because it's so close to home. So hopefully through this, we can help other parents cope with what they're dealing with. There needs to be more resources. I feel like we kind of failed the parents. As an educator, I'm just like, what more could I have done? What could I have seen? How could I have helped? In what way? Because there's that should not have been the route. There are so many other routes, but parents don't know that. Exactly. You know, in my journey, a lot of parents I met, they they didn't really want to do things with their children. They weren't similar to me. They were in school and, and left, went home. Like I was always trying to get my son with other students. That was where I was frustrated because even going to the card center, which has really good resources, I went since I moved back to Miami four years ago to hopefully regain more friends for my son. So the frustration was that most of the other parents were more interested to focus only on the academic. It's good to know that open up and be just the average, average child, you know? So anyway. But it's getting better. I met Agatha and she's got a wonderful son and daughter and you know, they, they want to hang out, which is, is a plus. It's a plus. That's a great point. And Agatha and I, we usually have a lot of discussion about that. 
in that the, the social component is very important. And if you think the social component for the kids are important, social component for parents helps a lot with the emotional aspect. And not just only having friendships with parents of kids with special needs, but we need all types of friendships. Exactly. Just business, but friendships with those kids are going to also be able to help your kid materialize into that independent kid that you want. And you know, they have to strive and try to perform at a higher level as well. So we want all kinds of friendships in order to balance our emotional health and to be able to give even better love and care and attention to our kids. Yeah, correct, correct. I wanted to ask, when does the Best Buddies program start? Like at what age? Sebastian's 15. I don't know much about the Best Buddies. Okay, well, I originally, we originally lived in Volusia County and he didn't get involved until he was in high school, 12th grade. But I'm not sure how young they are here in South Florida, but he was able to go to a college campus, UCF campus in high school. He was definitely not doing regular classes, but we're doing a lot of social skills on the college campus. So they paired him with a college student. And it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was awesome. It was really awesome. And like they actually t could take him out. He was over the age of 18. So they took him out. It was, it was just, it was just great. It's an awesome program. Since then, we moved back to Miami because of my job. Um, I put him in Coral Gables High, and they had it. They had it there. So he had two partners, um, one from Orlando, one from here in Miami. Uh, both were girls. Both were good role models. The only part about that is when school ends, that's it, pretty much. You know, they'll say hi. You know, they'll stay in touch a little bit. But after that, they have now uh, the adult best buddies. So they get together, you know, and um, it's all run by Anthony Shriver. Um, I don't know if you know who they are, but the Shrivers. And, yeah. um, but it's a big program. I mean, it's, everybody's happy. Um, the lady that's in charge is, I mean, it's awesome. Um, I know academic is important, but reality is important too. So those social skills you sometimes can't teach them, they got to learn. Sorry, guys. Sebastian wants to say hi to Miss Allison. Hi, Miss Allison. Get down. Get down. Hi, buddy. How are you? I'm you. Good and you? I'm good. I miss you. I miss you. This is Frisco's mom. Frisco's hi, mom. Frisco. Frisco's hi. Mom. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Awesome. Hello. Hello. <laughs> What's Agatha? What's the name? You don't tell need you, to tell me. Tell you don't need to tell me if you don't want hi. to. Hi. Hi. Hi, Sophia. Hi, Melanie. <laughs> Melanie. Hi, Sophia. <laughs> Hi, Melanie. So, best buddies, right? Or if anybody has information, if you guys can share, like, contact information, that would be great as well. I, I actually, getting best buddies involved with my son's school, he's in middle school, so oh, uh, cool. the information I could pass on to you, I don't have it on me right now, but you can go through your ESC department at, at the school and demand that they do best buddies. And um, we also have a, well, that's what sometimes what you have to do. What happens is you have to be like, okay, well, what's the number? And then I had to call and find out why. And this has just always been the way it's been. That's but how you get things done. That's the way to do it because it's the motivation. And then one person might say, Oh, I never thought of that. Mm -hmm. So that's positive for them because a lot of the teachers in ESD, they want to do more, you know, and like the best buddies will come in. If you're invited, they want to come into the schools. I just didn't know it was as young as the middle school, but mm -hmm. Hey, I mean, as young as possible to start, you know, it's good. Agreed. Well, as young as possible because, and this is a pivotal age group. And not only that, my son has a student mentor because there are students who can identify. Like one of the things that I do is I introduce my child to everyone at the school, including the police officers. They know that he's on the autism spectrum. 
I introduce him to the um, counselors so that they know he is there because they'll hear about my child at the school. <laughs> <laughs> and right. uh, the cafeteria, yeah, and the cafeteria, and uh, you know anybody who's anybody at the school, we cannot be afraid to introduce our kids to the people in the school because sometimes they have those moments where they're not like the perfect kid. I have a squiggly kid, and you're trying to fit him into this perfect box, and that's not going to happen. So let's take the necessary precautions and make sure that we introduce our kids to everyone at the school who matters, especially the police officers, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so sometimes the last person who hears about any issues with my son or a student is the ESC director. How is that possible? Because she may be teaching three or four classes for a week. And when you have 200 students in the ESC department, how are you going to teach five classes? It's impossible. But the, the ASC directors and you know people in charge are stretched to the max. And we have to take things into our own hands. And I think that's the only way. Being proactive, you can comp we can complain all we want. But if we're not proactive and we mean business, because my son is business. That's how I see him from the very beginning. And that's how it will always be. Is my first business. Before I go do any of my other business, sometimes I'm not to school until 11, 12 o'clock dealing with that business. Because when he's not okay, I'm not okay. Exactly. In terms of best bodies, resources, we need to make sure that we have those type of information and forward it to you guys as soon as possible. Well, you guys that have older kiddos, do you guys ever go to vocational rehab? I'm going through the vocational rehab thing now with Sebastian and um, Allison and I are trying to get the program started at like on the job training program at the school, which would be great. We're, you know, we're dealing with some people who don't want to listen. You know, we want to go ahead and bring it to the school. It will be, it was, it will be amazing for my son as well as all the other kids in the school. Not only my son, it'll be amazing. So have you guys been through through that? Have your kids done on the job training? I'm I have an experience with vocational rehab, but they basically the senior year of high school they come to school, evaluate your uh, whoever have an IP, they do evaluation, then they call the parent for the meeting, and basically based on that they determine that my son was above average for science and math and he's a good material to go to college yeah. so depends what your child where he is where she is they discuss with the parent they meet with you they ask you they talk to you and the student is involved of course mm -hmm. and they ask if that's the route you want to take they just do recommendation they cannot if that's something that you disagree then you ask for help with a job placement or but we just went with the flow and we continued the route going to college so they've been amazing support uh, my son received a full scholarship uh, from financial aid basically how it works they whatever financial aid doesn't cover because his classes was quite expensive the culinary lab classes could cost per semester up to five thousand dollars plus the books so financially it didn't cover everything so whatever they don't cover the vocational re rehab co cover a hundred percent basically so right now they Agatha, one of the things I would like for you to talk about some of the actions that you took to get to this point in your son's life, in your journey. What did it take? What kind of actions, what kind of mindset it takes to get to this point? Because a lot of parents, we talk about where we are, but we don't talk about the journey as to what it took to get to this point. What, it, what, it, what is the reality? That's a good question. <laughs> and, and first of all, I think determination from the get-go, like believing that 
I understood there will be a lot of obstacles, a lot of people that say no, it's impossible. I just dismiss them. And uh, if I may share one of his first evaluation, because he had several, they basically put me in a room with um, several doctors and students, which was quite intimidating when they evaluate my son being four year old. They told me, mom, your son, besides autism, he also have aut uh, mental retardation. So you have to be prepared. He won't go too far, you know, like prepare. He probably, so me being very young mom, I left this meeting very upset. I didn't even want a copy of this because they told me the recommendation would be institution, you know, like how could they without knowing me, without knowing him, our life based on, and I explained him, you know, sir, you don't know my son. It's okay. I know what he's capable. Uh, he didn't perform well on the test because he was like uh, experimental. He was intimidated. He couldn't answer simple question, which I knew he knew. So my advice to parents of a young kids is do not trust 100% all the tests or evaluation. Go with your heart. Talk to your child. Observe them. See what makes them happy. And it helps if your spouse is on board or your partner or you have a friend. My husband kind of have opposite views when it comes to Nathan. He, he didn't want him to go to college. He want him to go to Easter Seals. He want to keep him at home a lot. We didn't uh, participate in a lot of birthday parties or whatever, but it changed. It changed. Now I can tell he believe he's on board. So it's like teamwork. Like you don't want to feel like you're doing something against your husband or against your child will. Just teamwork, figure it out. And little steps, little steps. Like celebrate each achievement, you know? Like it's the best, you know, sometimes I watch the post of the kids doing that or that. That doesn't matter. Our achievement was when my son said his first sentence at years, seven years old. And we were like so overwhelmed, happy. And I know you had those moments too, sharing. So just celebrate that. And let them know let the kids know that they they are amazing every day let them know and knock on the doors because like in college a lot of people i'm one of the pioneers of letting them know that my son can do it if you don't know how to help my child meet with me i email all the professor some of them they told me in a career of 30 years i never have a mom here i'm like I don't mind because I'm helping my son I, by you by telling you that my son can pace in the class and he actually is learning absorbing the knowledge better I'm helping you because you are thinking that he's annoyed he's not listening so just great collaboration with teachers I discover become a friends with teacher Alison, I can tell that you are one of the greatest. And I still have friends of teachers from elementary school. Like, I treat them like partners. Like, we win this together, you know? Yeah. How can I help? How uh, the school system, if I, I may advise, they don't respond well to criticism. But when you open yourself and say I have this and this problem how about we do it that way let's address this out. what do you think like open the conversation show them that you are willing to collaborate because a lot of parents they have different mindset they say I dropped my child in school that's their job mm -hmm. that's never been my attitude I say that's my child and I'm here to help I admire the teacher who have 
20 kids, 15 kids. How do they do it? They're like, they need help. I need to support them. And if it, something doesn't work for you, the school, keep, keep a notebook, keep everything in writing, email. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be your best friend, your pen and paper, make everything in writing, that's it. Agatha, thank you so much, that was awesome. There's a reason why I always think of you as my sister from another mother because she has absolutely the same type of mindset and I always say, Agatha, I hope, I'm looking up to you because I hope that my kid would someday graduate from college because that's my goal no matter what anyone says, yes, I, you, I, I absolutely think in terms of partnerships with the school and the teachers, but the reality is that sometimes it's very difficult because we may not have an Allison Palmer in our midst, <laughs> and, and it, it's very challenging. It's very, very challenging because if we are going in there with our own mindsets, guess what? The teachers have their own mindsets, their own challenges, and we have no clue what is happening in the classrooms because that's just the way that the districts kind of sort of likes it. And forming those partnerships are sometimes extremely difficult, especially when you're an outspoken, assertive, and I'll put that in quotation marks, because you sometimes have to be very assertive to get the services or even a proper a valuable education for your child so we are facing a lot a lot of challenges not just showing up and this is one of the things that i i say to my other parents is that the first thing that we need to understand is that we need to show up but then how are we showing up how are we showing up to assist the teachers, how are we showing up to give value to our kids in every way possible? As Kelly was saying, it's not just the education, it is also how do we show up with our friendships? How do we show up? How do we show up? Are we putting our best foot forward? Are we asking people to do more than what we are willing to give? to our kids or are we showing from our example that we are going to do what is necessary and we have an expectation from the people who, whether they provide resources, whether it's a nonprofit organization, whether it's your son's teacher, whether it's the therapist, how are we showing up? Because if we don't show up in the right way, we're not gonna get the things that we need. And even when we show up the right way, there's a challenge there as well, because we're not, we're supposed to just accept whatever is handed out to us sometimes. And okay, so your kid is in the classroom. Okay, so he's okay, he's, the, he's all right there sitting in the corner without access to his education. Is that okay? No, that's not okay. But sometimes I think Parents don't know how to advocate. How do we show up as an advocate for our children so that we can turn out to be like the Agathas and the Kellys of the world, <laughs> okay? Well, in this new world, especially now more than ever, I believe resources would be minimized because budgets are going to be cut. Organizations are going to have to make some different decisions because they are not going to be getting the funding that they would need. People are out of jobs, and it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a major effect on all of us, not just kids with special needs, on all students, I believe. What do we anticipate is going to happen? Because I know Kelly and Agatha, you guys um, are looking for jobs for your, your kids because they're in the older generation. Chris is in high school now? Yes, I think we're in high school and I'm in middle school. So we're in, the, we're in all the different gamuts, right? Because we can also talk about the elementary section because we've been there and done that, but it's, it's never far from our memory. I just want to, to anticipate the challenges for the district moving forward in terms of reopening schools for medically fragile students, kids who need a lot of resources. 
they're going to make them wear the mask and everything, correct? We have kids who are sen with sensory deficits. So how is that going to look for our kids? I think they would have to have a, a lot more strategies in place for us to be able to send our kids back to school. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering what do you think some of the concerns would be with other parents or yourself? Because you're going to, even if your kid is going out to look for a job, he's going to be exposed to a lot of different challenges and dynamics out there and different people. Are you guys prepared for that? As far as me goes as being a teacher, I, I'm not sure how it's going to work for kids who don't understand how to social distance, how to, they need to wash their hands after they eat or before they eat or to cover their mouth, blow their nose. I have those issues with my, some of my students because they're not all on the same level. And then I have about 12 students in one classroom at a time. So it's like, how are we going to, how are we going to teach all these students at once while not putting them at risk? Isn't the school board talking about like teaching them half a day or like, divide up the classes in half and then teach, teach them Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and something like that. That's what I heard, that they're thinking about that, which means you got to amp up their full days in order to get the curric curriculum in. So they're that's going half, day, half days or only Monday, Wednesday, and Friday or something like that. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if they have that in place yet. I know that right now they're, I believe, talking about ESY, which is a big component for kids uh, who need summer school. And I'm not even so sure what, what's going to happen with that, but we're going to have to figure that out at some point. I don't know. I don't have the answer. So for me, it's going to come down to a personal decision. Am I going to even send my kid to school? And what are going to be the ramifications or the success of that? And uh, I think we will have to be more autonomous with our decision making because every kid is different. Every family structure is different. Maybe somebody in the home can do distance learning and there are some families who can do that. It will be on an individualized basis. Are you feeling comfortable with the strategies that they put in place to be able to send your kid back to school? What are you going to do if they're not going to get therapies at home? Are you okay with the regression that might happen? So we need to ask a lot of questions regarding if things are going to be okay. Are you going to be okay with them sending your kid home because he has a runny nose? Because everybody's very sensitive now about... Mm -hmm. about a runny nose, which, you know, a lot of our medically fragile students may have a runny nose, but that's just part of the deal because they may have allergies. There are going to be more discrimination for our kids. Allison, you brought up some, some, in, some great points, covering their mouths, being socially distanced. I know when my kid was in elementary school, he was, he's a hugger and a, you know, a tight hugger, you know? Is, was he going to understand then? No, I had to do a lot of training to make sure that he was, when he got to middle school, to make that transition, anticipating that the hugs may not be an appropriate thing as he gets older, taller, stronger. How do we, I think parents have to anticipate a lot of those issues that we may have and how do we handle those situations? because it's going to happen. You brought up a good point about the runny nose. Even though my, my personal children don't have autism, my, my daughter, she, uh, she has enlarged adenoids, so she can have a runny nose at any moment. And the school called and said she needs to go home because her nose was running. That's it. Nothing else. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you, guys. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. So you want to give us a little bit of details? We have about 25 more minutes about you and your son. Yes. Well, I have three kids. My oldest is, of course, Eden, with the one with, um, with autism. And he was diagnosed when he was two. Um, I know it's a roller coaster. It's been a battle with, you know, with um, basically with finding stuff that he needs. My advocate has always been Agatha. I always 
directly quirk to her because she's more knowledgeable of stuff that I'm not aware of. She's the one that pretty much have guided me through and opened doors to places where, you know, I didn't know where I need to knock on doors. So my, my advice, I mean, I always thank her for being there for me because, you know, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know what to do without her because, you know, her son obviously is a little older than mine. So with the experience she has, I always take advantage, you know, that she's always been there for me in a way that I always, she always give me advice and I take her advice very well, you know, uh, in a very good approach, obviously. So my other two kids are typical kids. I have a 12 year old and then I have my youngest who is nine years old. But of course, you know, as always, you know, um, my kids always, for anybody, they always have to be your guidance, your support, your strength in every way you, you can find, you know, and then having a child with special needs is kind, is kind of a challenge for every parent, you know, because all, all of us have this, the same situation, in different way or another way, but we always, you know, struggle in some way, in some another. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, you as a support, you know, finding a support like I have, you know, from Agatha, as it's always been a, a great um, pleasure having her, you know, and, you know, knowing that she's there for me as a mentor in every way. So I hope I can learn stuff from you guys as well. And I, like I said, um, I'm here to learn. I'm here to hear. I'm here to support. I'm also love to be an advocate like you guys and fight for what is right for our kids. My name, my name is Heidi. Okay, how old is your son? Just my um, Eden is 14. Okay, so he's also a middle schooler going to high school? Yes. Like, okay, so we have some transitions. So one in transition, uh, you are in transition. Curses has a high schooler. Her high school student, her high school teacher is Allison. Kelly oh. has a 20, how old? Five. 25 Five. year old. And Agatha, you know Agatha. Yes. Uh, <laughs> she's Nathan. Uh, my son is my son is the 15 year old. He's the middle schooler, so the youngest one. You brought up something that um, I also wanted to discuss, Heidi. Um, thank you for sharing. But one of the things is that having awesome mentors are integral. Mm -hmm. Not only having awesome mentors, I'm gonna make this short and sweet, it's also right. ensuring that when you have a mentor who gives you this advice that you act on it. Because a lot of times I see, I give information and nobody, and, and you're like, well, you saw them two months later, so did you call? Um, well, it was too far, it was too this. Right. Okay, well, I actually did some research to get that information for you. I had the resources for you, and I gave that resource. And what did, what did you do with it? So I think you may be seeing a great results because you follow up on what your mentor tells you. Because right. that's part of support as well. We think it's only just somebody giving us the information. But it's right. what actions do we take? to exactly. ensure that we follow those and, and sometimes it doesn't the information may not work for you mm -hmm. but trying new things and appreciation for the person who's your mentor i think is very, right. very important because it's two ways right it's not just you know because remember that that information is coming from a lot of experience and exactly. you don't know how much digging and grappling mm -hmm. that person had to, to do to be right. able to get that information to then exactly on. sometimes i have to go in my book 12 12 years ago exactly. to give to a parent who is just being in elementary school and then i am like oh my god i spent like the last two weeks looking for this information and this right is to send you to the right person Mm -hmm. And then they don't do anything with the information. So I think it, it's an exactly. overall mindset that is going to help your child. Because at right. the end of the day, the other thing that I want to talk about is having regret. Are you guys there? Mm -hmm. um, so um, mentorship is very important for Gross. support, for emotional well-being, and uh, taking action. Mm -hmm. That is whether you want to, to 
clean up your your personal life mm -hmm. whether because it's not you know what you need for making sure that to ensure your well-being and your kids well-being including exactly. action as far as uh, making sure your emotional health is mm -hmm. as stable as possible you right. have actions to do that right your health yes. your, wellness, your health your emotional health we think is only financial wellness but right. it's all kinds of wellness mm -hmm. right now we need to be taking care of our emotional health mm -hmm. as well um, if we're not healthy our kids aren't going to be healthy exactly if we're not physically active our kids are not going to be physically active it's very important the mentorship is very important so that we can reach out to someone who who knows better or who is going through the same thing or who isn't even going through the same thing because you'll be surprised how much support you can get out of the right. community of people who knows what your struggles mm -hmm. are. See the see the see the struggle, see you going through it, right be here with you, mm -hmm. support you emotionally. It may not be financially. I think most times it's not right. It's not financial mm -hmm. support we're looking for. It's really emotional support. When I say, oh my God, I'm so tired that they get that I'm tired because right now during distance learning, I am the teacher, Exhausted. the interventionist, <laughs> the para, the behaviorist, the mm -hmm. tutor, the OT, PT, speech, the <laughs> everything. everything. Yeah. Different roles. And mom. Mm -hmm. And mom. So you're dealing with sometimes 10 different roles. And I don't think most people understand because they used to hear about what is what's happening in the classroom, but they don't understand that the life still goes on. Exactly. And what kind of a support that we need for our kids. We have all of these therapists, all of these, these, uh, and, but what we don't usually have, what don't we usually have is somebody who takes care of the parent. Mm hmm the psychological, emotional health of the parent. And that's why Alejandro probably is where he is right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we don't think about the parent. But one of the things that my doctor does when I go into, his, into my son's pediatrician office, and I love him for it, the first thing that he does is he says, oh, how is Frisco? Then he asks me, mom, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. It's not about my child first. It's about right. me first. Exactly. And I think that is so important. I also, and I, and I actually curate professionals who do ask those questions because they ask, mom, how are you doing? This is his exactly. endocrinologist to his neurologist, if you need those names, I have, I have the best of the best of the best. And they would spend enough time with the parent to find out what it is that you do. How are you doing? Mom, it must be difficult right now. That's one of the things that I think professionals need to do right now is to find out how is the parent doing? Before you ask a question, yeah, you see the kid is okay. Mm -hmm. He's in the office. He's all right. Okay. Mom, how are you doing? Moms, how are you doing? Are you okay? Yeah. All right. This is my challenge. And based on what I tell him, then he knows how to go about dealing with my child. Mm -hmm. On top of what he deals with, with the pediatrician visit, he also deals with any of the challenges that I need, providing resources, providing some advice on how to go about moving, maneuvering through things. So it really does take teamwork. And I think we have to curate who handles our business, i.e. Mm -hmm. our children. It is a business. Yes. Because without our kids, we have to understand that we are employing several people we are employing several people who are detrimental to our kids health and wellness and if my kids health and wellness is not is not up to par i'm not doing very well mm -hmm. i want to know have any of your the teachers of your kids have they asked you how you're doing 
or have they just well i pretty much having uh one contact with one of the teachers from six teachers that my son has there's only one that has really like basically one and two communicate and do like a at least 15 minute zoom once a week that's what she's done and for my son it's like this is so virtual it's so new to everyone so seeing his classmate the ones that are able to log in and the ones that are able to be on zoom or you know because maybe parents have to work and it's just you know he i can see his joy his happiness when he's sees that that specific teacher you know my son has a para and she communicates with him almost every day and you know the fact that she's there for him and the that one teacher it's like it means a lot to him and it means a lot to me because that shows me how much they care mm -hmm. there's six teachers but mm -hmm. just one of them is able to do you know what she she really really cares for those kids you know and that's when you really see who really are the the person who, who has the chance and the time to give them the attention that they need i know everyone is busy but sometimes it only takes one little call to make the person happy and to make their day and i i mean i don't want to say that they're bad and stuff but it, it, it means a lot if it means a lot to my son that means a lot to me and that tells me a lot about how they are you know for sure because i i do try to advocate with my co-workers you know ask the parents how you're doing how they're doing ask exactly. them what they need help with because mm -hmm. a lot of them are like oh i'm not getting any feedback the kid isn't putting any work i'm like have you even tried to call the parent and just say you know what's up not even exactly just how are you feeling what's mm -hmm. new mm -hmm. um it's okay i feel like par parents or not parents but teachers feel like they need to keep up this border like they, exactly. they can't show their emotion like no it's time to break down that border so you can be able to understand the kid more you won't be able to understand the kid if you don't understand the parent mm -hmm. exactly. exactly that's, that's true i think all the time you have to you have to know the parents. We think that IEPs, and let's go into that. I think a lot of times the school believes that the IEP is for the student, but no, the mm -hmm. IEP should be something that gets, lets you get to know the parent, because once you know that that parent is not just looking for a babysitter at school, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you should know, you should understand more clearly that yes i am interested in a quality education and from my conversations you understand also that i will do what's necessary and partner with you and i actually know my child you're not telling me anything you actually right. telling me the right information which tells mm -hmm. me you're you're not interested in really what's happening with my kids so sometimes it's a hit or miss you know but i think we as parents have to understand i think we need one to have a session about an iep mm -hmm. as to what how powerful that parent statement is mm -hmm. that exactly. parents usually do not they have one little paragraph or one sentence my kid is really nice or good or loving that is not what right. a parent summary or parent mm -hmm. parent uh, statement should be and that's all first entry into who you are whether they read it or not it's there in writing mm -hmm. right and it's right. a very powerful part of your iep document that is going to help with charting the course as to what it is but it takes time it takes a really knowing your child and really anticipating what it is that you want to and what the goal is i always say i make a three-year plan and that three-year plan is always consistent and i adapt and change it as i go along and sometimes just to put a little twist in there i don't change it because i'm like we didn't get where we were supposed to be <laughs> okay <Yes. laughs> what are we going to do what what where, where did we have the failings what happened you know i hear all of this stuff but i don't see that but here's my 
here is my results from what I see at home. Mm -hmm. What are the developments that I see? You're seeing this? Here's what I see. Here's my data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we have to learn the different strategies, how to get what you want on the IEP, because if it's not on the IEP, it doesn't exist. It doesn't get done. And what I'm noticing is that one, the parents don't know how much they, how much control they have over the IEP. Mm -hmm. They're letting the school do everything for them. And I personally, and I'm just like, I, I don't want to do this by myself. I shouldn't be doing this by myself. And I shouldn't be telling you everything your kid needs. You should be able to tell me yourself what your kid needs or what he's missing. And I just add my input from what I see. It shouldn't just be about the teacher. Because right. you're exactly. your child. You know your child. You're a mom. I know my kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Allison, you're one of the rare of other ones that I could identify who really would advocate fiercely no matter what, because I always say at the table, you know, I understand that you're teachers and you're, you're um, you know, working at this district, but we all have the opportunity here to do the right thing. And the right thing is not about what is the district thing, but what is the right thing based on the law, based on what you know mm -hmm. about the child, based on all of those, those um, components, components, how do we come together and, you know, collaborate on, on writing up the, of the best plan, the best individualized educational plan for those who don't understand what an IEP is at this point so that our kids can have a fair chance at a fate. Can I do a little suggestion? Mm -hmm. Can I make a little suggestion? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so like when, when you're a teacher and you're um, ready to do an IEP, okay, my suggestion is maybe go um, before the IEP is due, uh, maybe at the beginning of the year. I forget when the IEPs are really done. They're usually done the year before, when the um, student goes to the next high school, no, no, the next it's at different no, no, no. It's it's based on. Let me just clarify that. Before. It's been a while for me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, now it's based on sometimes your your um your child's age group. Like my child, for instance, is born in April. In the beginning, before I knew how this would work, he would have it just before his sixth birthday, and then I really think that it's best. You can have an IEP, you can have, uh, what do you call it, Agatha, when you, when you're there's able to? 504, 504, there's IEP. Well, there are 504s, yes. Um, um, yes, but you can amend your IEP at mm -hmm. any time. You don't have to, if something happened, if you just found out you have a diagnosis for visual impairment, you don't wait until the following year to have an IEP. You mm -hmm. make sure that you make an appointment and you're going to you you're going to have to get there's a specific a legal period of time that you okay so i asked for an iep meeting and then they have a certain amount of time in within which they have to make an appointment and give you a date and then you respond to that and then you have your iep but they cannot wait for another year because your kid may need resources he may need larger prints he may need uh, access to um assistive technology so you don't want to wait you know parents tend to wait mm -hmm. and it might be detrimental to your students so i i suggest that you know we we move quickly you understand what an iep and this might be a good the next great thing the school is going to be reopening that we talk about because i think even when you transition out of high school you mm -hmm. do have another plan agatha and Kelly, you guys could probably tell us more about that. Yes, don't be afraid of the IEP meetings. You basically, if you feel like scheduling one every month, it's fine. Don't be intimidated, be prepared. And basically, I really wanna go back to the teacher, Alison, that Thank you for being you and and by you being you, you helping Heidi son teacher, you being an example, somebody's gonna follow your lead. 
because just by watching you, that's what happened in the college professor, it, in the college uh, setting for my son, it took just one professor to be that light for others. The, the one professor that believed and he wasn't, she wasn't scared of Nathan walking around or getting up. She mm -hmm. basically did her research, come up with a timer out there, and all the professors start talking. How do you do? How do you deal with him? And she said, What do you mean? How do you? Nathaniel is my best student. Just believe, believe. The teachers have to believe. Don't dismiss the parents, don't dismiss the student because if the teacher believe that our kids are capable, mm -hmm. we're gonna achieve great, great issues. And unfortunately with the school system and the doctors, always lack of time seem to be the problem. So when any of you find a great doctor, you are lucky, but let them know how great they are. When you find a good teacher, let them know how great they are. Not just buying them a gift, which is fine too, but verbally, let them know how appreciate because that will motivate them to not only do their job, continue doing the excellent job, but sp spread, it's, it's spreading, it's, it's gonna spread because they're gonna talk to their fellow, they're gonna share their experiments in, in the teacher's room with another for, oh, you know what happened to my student? He actually get an A, or he act, how, how? By parents involvement and this motivation, just, just let's talk, focus on the positive. Again, I'm repeating maybe the same thing, but I'm all about focusing on the positive. Right. You may be saying the same thing, but we all have different styles and they're all different kinds of parents. So we have to, it's, it's okay. It's okay. We say it in a different way and that's acceptable because nobody is either wrong. wrong. You know, you, we have different cultures, different, a lot of diverse voices and we need mm -hmm. to hear those different voices saying the same thing so that everybody knows that there's a place and a, and a, and a teacher out there for them and advocates that would just like working with them right some people like exactly. uh, a assertive person and that's mm -hmm. why we probably here on this table because we're probably more assertive in our style some people may be more the soft-spoken calm person who needs a little bit more hand holding and that's okay too right we mm -hmm. can all learn from each other i could learn to be a little bit more you know, soft and sweet and <laughs> And then there's somebody else who needs a little shaking up and know, hey, you know, this, right? So we need to learn different styles. And that's what, that's why it's so important that we hear at this table today. I'm so excited. So Agatha, <laughs> thank you for bringing up that, that point because yes, um, I have a, my son has a science teacher who is like Allison and she's amazing. She, she, She's always thinking about ways to help him. And, you know, he's actually her favorite student. Go figure. And I'm mm -hmm. excited because he loves science. And you know what? I don't think teachers understand how important they are to the success of those students. Mm -hmm. That just saying, hey, great job. Exactly. Mom, I know you put in a lot of work for that homework to be done the project to be done right mm -hmm. can really make you walk out of the school that morning when you drop off your kid it might have been like telling him you have to get out the car why are you afraid to go in because there are all these students in the front of the building and you have to walk in here and it's overwhelming and you're like as much as you feel like i know you're overwhelmed but we have to do it let's wait and you walk in and that teacher says something that's really great and then you're able to say thank you so much i really needed to hear that sometimes they don't know mm. because all the parents of the kids are complaining and saying how bad everything is and how terrible everything is you know just giving them up sometimes just saying hey i thought about you 
yeah. um, is very, to the teacher that is. I just thought about you, you had a call and bringing up uh, some tea. It's like a gesture of thank you. It really is important. So Agatha, that was a great point to bring up because we hear a lot of complaints. And by the way, the complaints, my son is in, um, the, on the standard curriculum in a gen ed classroom. And guess what? The complaints are coming more from other parents, could be coming from other, more from other mm -hmm. people who think it's just our kids, but kids are difficult in middle school mm -hmm. and in high school. Yeah. Just regular kids, and just regular, not. It's regular, it's, it's normal. I'm, I'm happy for the opportunity that he's going to a regular school mm. or he has a teacher or teachers who care about him and the environment, hey, it's hectic, but that's school. What do you want to do? You want to leave him at home? No, you want him to have those experiences. I think so. we forget about Kelly making her suggestion. Ah, Kelly, <laughs> Kelly, go ahead, make your suggestion. We want to hear. My suggestion, um, what for the IEP or the suggestion of what I do, um, you were speaking something and we cut you off somehow. You were uh -huh. suggesting something for the IEP, for the teacher. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, the so IEP, yeah, the IEP, um, like, for me, being a single parent and, you know, like, having three kids and one on a spectrum and running around crazy all the time, trying to get mm -hmm. it all done, being a superwoman, for me, what, what helped... It, if what would have helped a little bit more if the teachers maybe before the IEP might have might have gotten with you like if the teachers would like some help for the IEP you know which is very important um, but for those parents that wish they had a little bit more input at the beginning of the year trying to trying to I feel that if I would have gotten with the teacher earlier before the IEP I would have been better prepared you know, maybe by suggestion, the teacher would write something down. Hey, we're going to go through this in six months. Make sure you're prepared. Mm -hmm. um, just give me ideas on how his performance so far is and where he's at. Because, you know, I'm not the professional. I'm, I'm the parent, but I didn't go to college for it. And I don't know the professional uh, steps of how to teach it. I mean, I know how to be a parent and, and try, you know, to go through the whole system, but I think that would help at the beginning. Um, maybe you touch, you touch base with them and say, hey, by the way, remember, you know, your IEPs do at this point this year or the following, whatever. Make sure that you have some questions ready for me. I seemed that I was, I was a little behind on the questions. Um, especially through the high school year, I went through a small city, a small mm -hmm. town. Um, they had no idea. Tyler and Tyler was here and diagnosed in Miami when he was three. He was going to school at three in a regular elementary um, school with a class for autism. And I felt that the teachers, the young teachers, vibrant, sort of like yourself, were so interested. You know, they might not have been the best teachers, which I consider them they were the best, but the most important part about it were these, they were young, fresh out of college, very interested in trying to help, trying to conform to the student, not just what the, the laws protecting them and everything like that. And, and a parent that finds out at three, your kid is going to an uh, elementary school, you're like, oh my God, you know, and in that preparedness in Miami was awesome. Like some people might say, oh my gosh, Miami, the school system is not that great. Thank God I had the help when my son was young here because we went from here to a small little town who they just... They took the quiet ones and put them in the corner, and then they had a mixed VE class with, you know, um, more behavioral issues, and forgot about the, the, the ones that were very quiet, non-behavioral issues, and they didn't motivate them, you know what I mean? They just kind of stuck them in the corner, and so um, it's good that 
it would have been better if they would have been on it right when, right when I went up to the little town. I even called the card center of Orlando and they just started up at that point and asked them, hey, can you come up? Can you help me with an IEP? And they never showed up twice. So for me, it was a very much of a disappointment. I was alienated, alone. I didn't have the resources with any of the parents. So I would have expected more from the teachers at that point. So it was kind of like a battle. And also like going back to the medical field, psychologists at a young age when they told my son, oh, get prepared, you know, by the age of 13 when the hormones start changing, that you're going to have to get ready to put them in a, a home. And I'm like, I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You know, and I had one psychologist just like say, hey, you know, well, because I told him, like, give me an idea. What are you talking about? And um, he says, well, just face it, your kid is retarded. And you're like, what? Like, you're just like, I mean, listen, you know, like, I'll accept, you know, whatever I, you know, have and I appreciate it. But you don't know my child. You know, again, like Aga, Agatha was saying, um, only, I only really put forth the positive in all of those. It's hard for me sometimes. I'm going through something right now with a, with a medical doctor through a guardianship, trying to reverse it. And she's, she's not being fair at all. So I'm just looking at the positive, trying to get more support. So for everybody out there, especially with the younger kids, don't always, don't always listen, get an always second opinion and third, third opinion, but real, be realistic. So, but anyway, did that make sense? No, no, I can for me. Thank you. As somebody who's having to type up the new IEP and I get to see the old ones and I'm looking at them, I'm just like, wow, the teachers did not actually try to get to know the student because it doesn't match them at all. So I, I really try my best to learn them, learn what they like, talk to the parents and I like that you said that you, you wish they were more involved in the beginning because I will try to implement that for next year. I did ask, like, what kind of goal do you want me to focus on with your child? And I, I really do want the parents to understand the IEP process because I don't think they know. They, they just don't know. They don't. They like, I, what happened with me also when I went from the city, Miami, to mm -hmm. the small town with the IEP, IEP here, which was awesome. You know, like the, the teacher did hold my hand because of course it's the younger years. You didn't know what to do, where he's supposed to be at speech, what level, whatever. And I thank God that he had all that intervention at the beginning. But when I got up to, when he was nine and we went up to, I guess he was seven, we went into middle school, the teacher threw away his, I, um, all his paperwork following. She just threw it away. It's such a heartache because you're like oh my gosh I'm fighting with this and you know what happened and I tried to fight hard and like the teachers pretty much won because they weren't they weren't they were like this is how we do it and that's it I'm like how can you throw away his paperwork like you know it's in his IEP he goes well you know like his reading log everything he was doing touch math all this at the beginning and she goes we don't do that here we don't do this in that do this in that county I said, well, no problem. Can I have the paperwork back? And she says, I threw it away. I'm like, how can you throw it away? So I have a lot of negative experience in a small town, which everybody is like, oh, I think I'll be safe. Let's, let's all move out of a crazy city like Miami and go to a small little town to alienate our child. I didn't, for me, it was not a good experience. Thank God I ended up moving back to Orlando, which was excellent. And they got him in the, going back to the work program in the, in the high school, going to vocational rehab, um, what you guys were speaking about before. He actually got into a little section of internship at the hospital and they did everything with him. They took him around everywhere between planting plants in the hospital, um, the mail room, to cleaning the bed sheets from the patients coming in. 
to transporting any of the blood work, going from a small little town into a city, you're like, oh my gosh, there's some people that, that see, see my view, you know? So that was a help too. Thank you sorry, so much. Sorry to babble. No, we're babbling. We're all babbling. That's what we should call this session, babble. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's so important. I mean, you think that you're babbling, but there are a lot of people babbling and not being able to hear other people's responses to that. And I, I know it's been a while since you had an IEP meeting, but IEPs have changed a lot and doing one is, is very time consuming, especially when you know what you're doing as a parent. To address your point about that you wish that you knew more before you actually went into the IEP, there's a way to get around that. I'm just, just addressing these things because there might be more people listening to this and uh, you want everybody to hear how to go about doing a proper IEP. Now, the first thing that I do, and I could only speak about myself right now, the best way to get those re the results that you want and the knowledge that you want is that you can meet with the parent like Miss Allison and, the, and address the grades or anything that you see is happening with your child during the school semester. You know that an IEP is coming up. And by the way, even if you think you need to have a change in the IEP, you, you can ask for that meeting, right, Allison? And you then I'm always, I, am, I, I have been that student in college or anywhere where I'm like, okay, so I got a B. Why, why did I not get an A? So I'm that same parent for my child, right? I'm going to find out what, okay, so what was the problem? If he had a problem, why can't you tell me about this problem? Call an IP meeting. And by the way, just so we all understand this, it is not only the parent who should call an IEP. Anybody in your child's team can call an IEP. It is in your best interest that your OT can call an IEP if they feel like there is something going on that they need to call and make a change. However, don't depend on them. You have to be on top of our game to call that IEP. If you don't like what's happening in the classroom or your kid is being bullied or just whatever it is, you try to have an IEP meeting. You meet with the Allisons of the world or the non-Allisons and you ask for what you need. And not only that, I do not have an IEP without having a draft. If they don't want me there drafting that IEP, I always ask for a draft of the IEP so that I'm not getting that IEP in the middle of a meeting where my head is all over the place with like 14 people looking at me. And I refuse to do IEPs unless there is a document in my hand before a week or so, a couple of days before the IEP meeting so that I can look at it, I can compare it to the old one, not in the middle of an IEP meeting, so that you have preparation. So those are some of the ways that you can get more knowledge. You can see what they plan, because when, you give them a, when they give you a draft, that draft should not be the same IEP that you had in 2019. That draft should be something that is going to be moving your child forward, dealing with all of the deficits, or successes because yes they do have successes no matter what they say they do have successes unless they were sitting in their room playing games or something like that and even then i would say oh well, his fingers are moving faster <laughs> i mean you know you have to look for successes in every way 100 fact that your iep should not look the same and i don't care same. what anybody says if it looks the exact same if it looks like they copied and pasted that is illegal it has to be different it has to be different and the parent is the only one the caregiver is the only one who has that vested interest unless you have i will say it again the allison of the world <laughs> okay on your side as an advocate <laughs> it's not going to happen you have to Look at your IEP. Asking for that draft is very important because everything that you may have missed during the semester, you will see at the end. Sometimes it's stuff that you never even heard of. You're like, what? Who is this kid? I always say, who is this kid? You're not, this is not the same. This is not the person I know. And you better have your facts when you're going to your IEP meeting because nobody knows your kid like you. 
So, you know, unless you have again an Allison in your corner who knows you, who've been, you know, working with you steadily and doing everything possible to make sure she gives the best to her students. I'm not saying that all teachers don't want to give the best to their students, but it's kind of difficult. Sometimes you have the politics in the school. Sometimes you have all these different things that, you know, skews the dynamics. And sometimes there are too many kids in the classroom. My son's class probably has 20 kids. That's a struggle. So when you show up, you have to show up with your data and your facts and everything like that. And it's no special needs. Um, shaming here but it's just that's just the reality the reality is that now more than ever there are more students with special needs but how do you make your kids stand out so that your teacher knows that i'm showing up and then my expectations also there's nothing wrong with having expectations from the system nothing wrong with having ex expectations based on the law nothing is wrong with having ex expectations as to what's going on, what the goals that you have for your kids, and that's what an IEP is really supposed to be for. How do we reach those goals? How are we going to put SMART goals into place? And my thing is, if I have SMART goals, I want SMART responses and a SMART IEP being developed. So with that, I think we have a lot to talk about because school is going to reopen and maybe we need another session because we'll have to talk about employment for kids like Agathas and Kelly's. What kind of resources are out there? What are the challenges that they're gonna have moving forward? And then we have transitions for cursed, right? Cause, cause your kid is already in high school. And then I have the challenge of my own kid making a transition into high school. So we all dealing with transitions, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. All dealing with transitions. Also our own transitions, because I'm sure Agatha and Kelly, you guys are going through your own transitions as well, having complete adult. Boy, we thought it was difficult when they were in school. <laughs> we have our own challenges. Being in school and then the challenge of finding proper employment for them outside of the school system. Exactly. Going through the same things like everybody else, unemployment at the moment, keeping them occupied proactively, mm -hmm. you know, putting things in measures, probably girlfriends, you know, um, girlfriends <laughs> or boyfriends. I mean, they're, they're adults and human as well. And we want them to be as as productive and as normal as any other kid out there. And usually when they're in college, they have girlfriends or boyfriends and different relationships and not wanting to be with their parents, but it just depends. So we have a lot of things that we need to discuss and I look forward to us continuing our discussion. It was great that we were honest about what's happening in our lives and hopefully we can share a lot of this in the future with other parents. So yes, I'll thank you. Is there anything else that anyone wants to discuss or to ask? for the young uh, parents of younger parents? Like, I just want to let you know because I don't know if you hear it a lot that it's gonna be okay. I uh, mm -hmm. I can tell you that what when the years pass, I don't know if Kelly feels the same. I became more relaxed accepting accepting and first of and most of all don't see this disability as a burden i mm. see the gift from god when you when you come to accepting and loving you you seem to smile more often less stressed and mm -hmm. and give them more freedom i still struggle with that but i i see how our kids they want to be independent mm -hmm. and it's okay to let go it, they're gonna be fine am i not worried about my child yes i got a phone call from one professor that they almost saw my son being run over the car because he was running he had two hours break between the class and then he realized the time and he started running across the street.
but we won't be there every minute of their life and we do the best we can we're doing great job so just i want the, the message is for you guys to like just make sure you know that that our kids gonna be okay they are fine they are protected mm -hmm. that's it great to meet you thank you so I'm going to sum that up there. Uh, Agatha, thank you so much. Uh, Kelly, Chris, Chris uh, uh, Heidi. Thank you. Austin, it has been awesome. Thank you so much for starting, I say, a new journey with me and including you guys in this. I think I wouldn't have it any other way. I hope more parents are willing to be transparent about their journeys and dealing with any of or all of these challenges and successes because we do have successes and i want to ask you guys for one thing that you believe was very successful for you during COVID 19 because everybody's complaining and i just want to hear some good news okay i'm gonna start <laughs> with uh, press it my god <laughs> one thing I, one th well i have them back here i have them right there <laughs> mr sebastian but uh one of the things that that i he loves the outdoors he loves to be out and about he, he loves just to nature and and watching people work and this and that and i was just really concerned about how i was gonna keep him in lockdown but to my surprise he did incredibly amazing i mean just amazing I was, I was just so, I, I was very nervous. I never stopped working. I always went to work, but then I was very nervous. I was very, Allison will tell you, I was very ner nervous with the whole homeschooling, with the whole getting on online and all that. And they've been doing amazing. They've been doing wonderful. I mean, it, it's a crazy world we're living in right now. So for us, even for us, but more so for them, you know, especially a child such as Sebastian that loves the outdoors, loves to be outside, loves to be here, there, loves to be everywhere. And then you're getting him and you're putting him in a little box. I was super nervous. But thank God, it worked, it's working out perfectly and he's doing amazing. He's doing great, right, Sarah? Yes. All right. <laughs> like that. Okay, Heidi. When my son is, I mean, he does love outdoors as, as well as her son. I think every kid um loved the outdoor, but it was kind of difficult in my in my position because I have the other two that I have to like, kind of like hold on. I mean, typical kids always sometimes don't understand what the situation might care, you know, might be, and keeping them indoor have actually gave me the the chance to teach my daughter someone had to do more baking because she loves baking she loves all that. i'm like oh that would be perfect so getting him involved into learning by breaking an egg something that he didn't know in this two months or so that we have been in quarantine he knows how to break an egg and he knows how to take a shell because he knows we don't cook the shell we only cook the yolk and the, the egg white whatever it might be but it's just like every weekend once a, once a week he does that and now um to entertain myself and even my daughter because she has she's 12 years old but she's just like an adult and she has become so responsible in every way that i think us parents we complain but in reality in my case i really don't complain i think it brought me closer to my kids because them being in school is more like a rush hour. Everybody's like, oh, you got to do this. Oh, you got this. Oh, you got therapy. Oh, you got, it's always in the go and you're in your stress and you, and you just, you just don't enjoy them. And you know, like what I have to say, it's going to be okay. And, and the other um, parents, it will be okay, but it's not okay. I would say when, when younger kids are like, like they want to be outdoor, but keeping them in, in home, it's kind of like brought everybody together. Family got together, more communication has, you know, in my kid, you know, my, my kids are always like, oh, mommy, I have to do this last minute. Letting me know, mommy, you have to go buy me this. Cause I have to, I'm like, really? Two nights before your, your project is due? And there I go in a rush, running to Walmart, running to wherever I needed to go. But I think that this was what we needed somehow, somewhere. 
God works in mysterious way. And I think that so many, so many of us, it, it was a positive way, you know, that it was, it, it was positive because we learned how our kids are like, they're kids, you know, like, and we take them for granted sometimes. I, I mean, I speaking for myself, I take my kids for granted in a way that I'm like, I expect more from them. I'm like, God, why do I expect them, you know, in school? Because teachers drive you crazy. Oh, you remember your, your kids need to do this? And I'm like, oh my God, like Zoom, now Zoom is being like a release. Yeah, you become the extra warrior mom, homework teacher, everything that you mentioned. But at the same time, you enjoy it because you're like, wow, like now I can see myself be being a shoe of a teacher because you guys go through a lot. I, res I have respect for them. And yeah, some of them earn their titles, some of them don't, but it's okay. At the end of the day, your kids are the ones that give you the strength to move on. Your kids are the ones that give you the, the belief that, hey, mom, we can do this. We did it. We can still do it. And, you know, like I'd say, in my case, with my three kids, they tell me, mommy, let's do yoga. Really? Yoga? Okay, let's do it. Even my, even Eden, who's, you know, my oldest, he's like, yoga and he knows the schedule we have an alarm he knows hey uh, he tells my daughter can we do yoga and he knows it's yoga time because not until he knows the alarm goes on that's when he knows it's yoga time or it's baking time and little by little i mean it's kind of like they get used to it and i like it i i enjoy it very much i enjoy i, I find myself less stressed driving around I have, you know, them in three different schools. So it's like driving for the school, going to another school, picking them up early, then after school. No, no, no. It's just crazy. So to me, this quarantine has been the best I think I ever enjoyed my kids because I'm, they're here with me. You see, I don't have to be sharing them with anybody. <laughs> it's been, I've been selfish in a sense because teachers spend most of the time with them. And at the end of the day, it's the nighttime and you just go back to the same routine, cooking dinner, making this. Okay, did you see your homework? Yes, we did it. Boom, fine. It's all over. And then it's the routine again and again. And you kind of lose that communication with them. But nowadays, you learn to build. You learn to get to know them better. And that's just me. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Ellie? Hi, Heidi, thank you very much. You said almost everything I wanted to say. <laughs> it was like ditto, it was like ditto. I actually got to work for, from home and I realized how resilient we are in crisis, yes. like, which is really crazy. And it was great to see that our kids could do it too. Exactly. And, um, this is my son right here. I don't know if you can see him, but that's hey, Tyler. Hey. Hi. Can you see him? <laughs> There's always hope. That's the most important part. Yeah. And I don't want to repeat what Heidi said, but I'm saying the same thing. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Agatha? <laughs> okay. Uh, many, many wonderful things happen. As usually, being positive, I want to share something incredible. My son start exercising first time in his life. Nice, Agatha, nice. He likes running and walking that he loves to do, but he just look up his favorite YouTube and every day for one hour, he writes things down. He has a goal. He has no belly, but he, he wow. hire me. <laughs> so yeah, that's something. Does different and uh, we just discover how having artists we think that they like to be alone in the room. No way. He he express himself now. I can hear him even louder. How much he miss his college, his core mm. friends, but his the people around. Like I did, I wasn't even aware of that. That he he loved going outside so much. Mm -hmm. I thought he wanted to be in his room. So I learned more about my son. That's good. Mm -hmm. Allison, uh, for me, my own personal experience, uh, it's been hard having my two kids in house each on Zoom at the same time. But uh, spending time with my youngest, she's two. 
I did not know she could talk. <laughs> and she speaks fluent English and Spanish to my surprise. Nice. Those two predominantly uh, Spanish daycare. And she's just like, Mommy, I want juice. Get a Google. Like, if I don't say it, answer her. <laughs> It's nice. <laughs> so that was one of the major pluses, and she's very independent. Uh, like she wants to go outside, she wants to do everything. So it's like I get to step back and see my kids for who they really are. Because I did, I, I had absolutely no idea she could talk, none whatsoever. <laughs> 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 and. Uh, Thank you, everybody. For me, I think my most precious commodity has always been time. And uh, I, I, I agree with everything that you're saying, but I think summing it up to having more time for quality to maintain, for me, a quality relationship with my son. And also, this has been a pivotal time for him turned 13 and I remember not knowing what it was going to be like just having a goal and wondering wow when he's 13 I, this is going to be big what what is it going to be like because I'm hearing all this noise and all this chatter about what is not possible and here we all are looking forward to our next conversation so anyone who's been dealing with the challenges or successes and are anxious about what you did or didn't accomplish. Think about it this way. You and your child are resilient and your children are resilient. And we are going to be okay, as Agatha said, that we're going to have challenges, continue to have challenges, but it's how we deal with them. We have to take action, we have to seek out mentors, and then we do the best that we can. That's all we can, our kids will probably need from us and we move out from there. So thank you, ladies. Thank I you. Appreciate you. I hope that we get together and we should have next time we having sangrias or wine. <laughs> so we really need to get together more often and reach out to your support system and hope to see you soon. There'll be another invite and I hope that you can bring more people along on this journey with us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Have a bye. Nice to meet you, everybody. Bye. 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 So thank you, everyone. I really appreciate that you are here with me to listen to our multiple disability challenges and successes, and I hope that you would gain some insights as to how to move forward with your adults, with kids with special needs. It's integral that we take those actions and that we develop a positive mindset to be able to give proper examples to anyone who provide you resources or services in the community, as well as, and most importantly for your child. So if you need to send me any questions, you can email me at Herman, H-E-R-M-I-N-E -E, Wilson123 at gmail.com as you would see in the program. And I look forward to hearing from you. If you have any questions about IEPs or relationship building or the services that I've used for my child have progress with his abilities, please let me know. It's Herman Wilson, 1L123 at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Take care of those blessings. Bye.